chapter four, the uncertain life of an African farmer. To me, graduating primary school and being a scientist was loads better than farming, which was, by then was taking up a lot of my time. As much as I enjoyed my holiday break, most of it was filled with help by helping my father prepare the maize for harvest. In Malawi, maize is as important as the water we drink. We eat maize for every meal, mostly in the form of maize smell, which is a kind of doughy do porridge. Maize smell is made of mixing maize flour and hot water. When it comes too thick to stir, you scoop it out and, and form cakes in the shape of hamburger patties. To eat maize smell, you tear off a piece and roll it into a ball in your palm and then scoop it in your relish. Stewed spinach, pumpkin leaves, and whatever happens to be in season. If your family is fortunate, maybe you also have some eggs, chicken, or goat meat to go along with it. My favorite meal in the world is meat smell with dried fish and tomatoes. Yum. As I said, meat smell is so important to our diets that whenever we go without it, we feel like a fish out of water. For instance, let's say that someone from America invites a Malawian to dinner and serves a plate of juicy steak with mashed potatoes followed by great slices of chocolate cake for dessert. If there's no meat smell, a Malawian will probably go home and tell his brothers and sisters there's no food there, only steak and mashed potatoes. I hope I can sleep tonight. Growing a good maize crop is difficult and takes a whole, the whole year. It's not just the planting and harvesting that keeps us busy, it's also preparing the soy, soil, adding fertilizer, and killing the weeds that grew around the plants. Such work required every family, every person in the family. My sisters help with the planting and harvesting, but mostly they assisted my mother around the house, fetching water and firewood, cooking and cleaning, and helping to take care of the little ones, which meant that most of the field work fell on me. We began in July when we carried the remnants of the previous season's harvest. We collected the old maize stalks and out, placed them in piles. Once they were arranged, Jeffrey and I set them on fire. The best thing about burning stalks was, were the grasshoppers. The insects liked to burrow into the piles, and once they saw smoke, swarmed out by the hundreds. We caught them and put them into sugar bags. How many do you have, Mr. Jeffrey? I'd ask, helping through the smoky fields. Lots, he'd say, holding this bag, maybe 50. Yeah, same here. Shall we eat? For sure. The only reason we caught grasshoppers was to roast them over fire with salt, which we did with great excitement. This might sound disgusting to some people, but trust me, there's nothing more delicious than crunchy roasted grasshoppers with meat smoke. Of course, Jeffrey and I weren't supposed to be hunting and eating grasshoppers while we worked, but in Malawi, we have a saying, when you go to see the lake, you also see the hippos. The hardest work in the farm in farming was making bridges. These are the two or the long dirt <coughs> rows that you see in any field. On my farm, we didn't use a plow or tractor to dig them, dig them but a hoe. And digging them took all of my time. I'd start in the morning before school, waking up <coughs> at 4 a.m. when the land was still dark and cool. My mother would be ready with a steaming bowl of fala, which was it a kind of oatmeal uh, made from maize. After eating, I stumbled down the trail, dragging my hoe behind me. Be careful with that hoe in the dark, my father would call out. I don't want to cutting off your foot, for sure. <coughs> Excuse me. The big bright moon threw creepy shadows along the road. I walked quickly, trying not to think about the ghoul wakumbu watching me from the trees, or the witch planes that flew overhead looking for fresh recruits. One morning, while I was walking, a hyena called out from the bush, Awi, and caused me to jump out of my trousers. I'd never run so fast. After digging ridges, we'd wait for the rainy season so we could plant. The rain usually came the first week in December. My sisters and I moved in a line down the rows. One person made a gash to the hoe while the other dropped tree seeds and covered them with soil and a lot of good wishes. A couple weeks later, when the seedlings pushed through the ground, we gave each spoonful, each a spoonful of fertilizer to help them grow strong. Buying seeds and fertilizer cost a lot of money, and because it always happened in December, sometimes it meant there wasn't much left for Christmas. We never had money to buy presents, especially because we had a lot of kids. So for us, the perfect holiday was simply enjoying a luxurious meal of chicken and rice together. If there was any money left over, perhaps we'd get a bottle of Coca-Cola from the market along with some dandy sweets. Then after December, all the money was gone. Worse, by the time, by this time, most families' maize supplies were also running low. Outside, it rained day, night and day. Um, it was time when people tightened their belts. It was a time when people tightened their belts and waited for the harvest, which didn't arrive until May. That's when the maize stalks finally stretched above my father's side in a whole green field would whisper the fortunes of the wind, your fortunes of the wind. Harvest was like one giant party. Everyone in our family headed into the rows and, and worked from sun up till sundown, singing, telling jokes, dreaming about the great meals to come. After we'd spent we'd spend um, a week shucking the ears, the maize was giving was placing uh, giant bags and went back into storage room, giving us another year's worth of delicious food. In a good harvest, the bags rose to the ceiling and spilled into the hallway. For poor families like ours, it was, it was like putting a million dollars in the bank. That was in a normal year. In December 2000, everything went terribly wrong. Our first problem was the fertilizer. For years and years, the Malawian government made sure the price of fertilizer and seed was low, enough so every family could afford a crop. But our new president, a businessman named Bakili 
Maluzi didn't believe the government's job was to help farmers. So that year, the price of fertilizer was so expensive that most family, ours included, couldn't afford to buy it. That meant when the rains came and the seedlings pushed their way through the soil, they had nothing to give them. Sorry, guys, I said as I stood in the field, you're on your own this year. For the farmers who were able to afford fertilizer, it hardly mattered anyway because as soon as the seedlings showed a tiny favor, the country began to flood. Heavy rains fell for many days and days, washing away houses and livestock along with the fertilizer and many of the seedlings themselves. Our district survived without much damage except the rain, when the rains finally stopped, they never came back. Malawi entered a drought. With no rain, the sun rose, angry in the sky each morning, showed no mercy on the seedlings that had survived. By February, the stalks were wilted and bent toward the ground, and may half a crop was scorched. The plants that remained were only as high as my father's chest. If you took one of the leaves in your hand, it would crumble into dust. One afternoon, my father and I stood in the field and studied this, destruct this destruction. What will happen to us next year? Pop, I asked. The letter said, I don't know, son, but at least we're not alone. It's happening to everyone. There was no celebration at harvest. We managed to fill only five bags of maize, which occupied only a corner of the storage room. One night before bed, I saw a kerosene lamp flickering in the hall and found my father standing in the open door. He was staring at those bags, but not like a man counting his riches. He seemed to be asking them a question. Whatever they told him, we'd find out soon enough. Chapter 5, Malawi's Begin to Starve. Part of